Today we're going to be speaking with or hearing from Linda Green. Linda Green has worked with CAL FIRE for over 30 years. She is currently a division chief in the Sonoma Lake Napa unit with oversight of the Emergency Command Center, Safety Training, and Fleet Management programs. And before that, she was the camp commander for the Delta Conservation Camp. And even before that, she worked in the Cobb area, both as a fire captain and battalion chief for over a dozen years. Linda was the incident commander on the Valley Fire during the first burn period. And so with that, I'll pass it off to Linda, and she's going to tell us about her experiences. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yep, you sound great. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, showing up today. Uh, I'll get started here talking about the fire. So uh, the first 911 call came in at uh, just after 13, 20 hours in, in the, the afternoon of the 12th. Uh, it was reported as uh, approximately a half acre uh, already threatening the, uh, uh, the house right next to uh, where the fire started and uh, neighbors were actively engaged in trying to put the fire out. Uh, this is a general uh, overview of the area uh, from a satellite perspective. The fire started up in the upper left hand corner just below the small community of Glenbrook and uh, ended up down at the bottom right hand corner of the map and actually on beyond that by the time it got done making its run that uh, that night. Uh, the initial dispatch uh, provided a, a typical high dispatch for us in this area. One air attack, two air tankers, a battalion chief, uh, six engines, one hand crew, and two dozers. The only thing we were a little light on was the hand crew. Uh, the local Kanakdai camp was at drawdown so other crews were coming from other areas of the state. Um, this map is a uh, perspective of the Cobb area. Uh, the north, north is at the right-hand corner of the map, and I use this perspective because I think it will help show how the fire progressed a little bit better than uh, other angles. So the fire originated in the upper right-hand corner where the red dot is. Um, Copper 104 arrived at scene uh, within 10 minutes, uh, reported it as being three ink three acres with a potential for uh, 20 acres. By uh, 2 o'clock that afternoon, uh, the fire had uh, progressed to uh, 50 to 60 acres, and uh, this is about the time that part of the uh, Helltack crew was involved in a burnover situation and had to uh, get into their fire shelters. Uh, somebody took this uh, photograph uh, from Bottle Rock Road north of the fire. In the background you see Cobb Mountain. Uh, the elevation of that's uh, just over 4,700 uh, feet. When I drove through the Bottle Rock Road area and uh, saw the same smoke column, that's not what it looked like when I drove through the area. Um, it was uh, still going straight up vertical. I mean, it was a dense white column, but uh, it wasn't as, as tall as uh, Cobb was. And uh, it actually had a little bit of a tip sheared off because of a uh, obviously there's some uh, high level winds at that time. Uh, the cloud cover from uh, Hurricane Linda that was drifting into the area was well above the top of Cobb Mountain. Uh, uh, very blue in color so I recognized it as having some moisture in it and given the gap between where the top of the column was and uh, where the cloud cover was I thought it would take an awful lot of energy to uh, disrupt that uh, cloud cover. And as soon as you get past this point on Bottle Rock Road, you're back into the canopy. You can't really see the, uh, the smoke column from that point on. I uh, met up with the Battalion Chief Greg Fratelli. He was, he was the initial attack guy. I see uh, just north of the fire area, we spoke briefly, and uh, he was tasked with uh, dealing with the hill attack crew burnover situation. I kept driving south on Bottle Rock Road. Uh, this is Bottle Rock Road right through here. And uh, as soon as I came around this bend, I was driving through heavy smoke for a good half mile before until I got to about this location. And uh, it was heavy white smoke. There was no flame front on the west side of Bottle Rock yet, but there were definitely spot fires on the east side of Bottle Rock. Um, there's a small creek drainage that runs parallel to the road right there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, you know, they, uh, the spot fires were at least moderate range uh, spotting. 
uh, just before three o'clock, the air attack uh, gave an update on the fire size as approximately 200 acres. Um, by then, I had already uh, given the unit chief a, a phone call. He wanted an update on the on the firefighters, and they had been transported up to the hell attack base, uh, waiting for a a ride from the air, local air ambulances. So I gave him a quick update on that. And then we talked about the potential for the fire. And uh, I was still basing my decision on, on the smoke column I saw when I first drove into the area. And basically I told him, give me give me about an hour or two to see if I can uh, do something with this, with the, the equipment I knew was coming in. By then, uh, Bertelli had already ordered additional uh, engines and water tenders and uh, you know it was going to be close but I thought we still had a chance um, but then we talked about also talking about the fire I did tell them however if it crossed highway 175 uh, go ahead and order a team he was already talking about that so this is highway 175 here down by the Hobergs and, and the uphill side of Cobb And after I left the hill attack base, I knew I needed to uh, reestablish uh, contact with the fire somehow. And the fastest way to do that actually was to drive down by this golf course. Let's see if I can get my arrow again. It's not going to let me do it. So here we go. Uh, this is the Adam Springs golf course here in the lower right-hand corner of the map. And uh, I originally drove around the north side of it and came back in on uh, this road called Lima. And when I got to about this point, I could see what the smoke column was doing. And uh, it, the entire column had tilted over with wind on it. And so I knew uh, already that things were not going to go the way I was hoping they would go. Over the next 90 seconds, there were multiple 911 calls into our command center. Uh, the first one was actually came from a resident by Whispering Pines that's at the left left side of the map. We're uh, reporting a new fire at that location of the red dot uh, by Gifford Springs Road. Uh, the next call came in uh, from the Pine Summit area, which is at the right side of the, uh, of the map, uh, near where the arrow is. Uh, resident reporting the fire was up on Shasta Road. And the final call that came in in that 90 seconds was the uh, lower right hand dot, uh, a gentleman reporting his house was on fire. Uh, the distance between Whispering Pines and the two areas in Cobb is uh, 1.8 miles as the crow flies. Um, so think about that for a second. Um, just after 3 o'clock, the air attack uh, gave another update on the fire. It doubled in size, uh, 400 acres, and running, uh, spotting up into the forest. There were, uh, I had driven, once, once I left the golf course, I drove up into the Hobergs Resort area. There were still residents there, and I, I told the, one of the employees that he needed to get those people out of there. And, uh, of course, he had to ask the question, well, is the threat imminent? And, and I have to be honest, from his perspective, he couldn't see the smoke. There, there were no flames visible. The only Code 3 equipment he had seen was my pickup truck. So I could understand why he he didn't see the threat. But once I told him the fire was on the east side of Bottle Rock and uh, with a wind pushing it, and I couldn't guarantee that it would stop the fire before it got to his place, uh, he nodded his head in agreement and, uh, and started getting people moving. From there, I drove back here along at Highway 175. I dropped down on the Summit Boulevard to see what was going on down here. Right about here, there are two fire engines that had just come into the area. Um, this right here is the Pine Summit Pool. Um, I continued driving and uh, ended up coming up this little spur road where it dead ends. There's a preschool and I was actually very glad that there weren't any little kids in there because it was Saturday. But then it dawned on me that it's Saturday, so all those little kids are out in the neighborhood. Uh, so I definitely turned back around and got on my PA system and uh, started driving through uh, this area, uh, making announcements for evacuations. Um, when I got back to about this area, that's when the fire was reported at, uh, at Gifford Springs Road. So I, I left the neighborhood. I didn't think I had anything else in the area. 
and so I went to scout that out. Um, the fire here at Whispering Pines ended up being called the Valley 2 fire for a little while. Um, it started in, in the meadow, which is relatively flat, and when I drove on to Gifford Springs Road, um, again, this is Highway 175 through here, and this is Gifford Springs Road. So I drove up Gifford Springs Road and looked into the meadow because I knew I'd be able to see into it real easy. There's nothing but a fence line along there. And the fire was already about an acre, growing in a circular um, fashion, so there wasn't really any wind on it at that particular moment. Uh, about 30 seconds later, another battalion chief coming up, 175 from Middletown, arrived at the scene of this fire. Uh, so I left it to him to take care of it, and there were other engines coming up the hill. But uh, I needed to get back to the command post so I could uh, meet up with other other officials to start coordinating our actions on this. Um, like I said, the, the Valley 2 was initially sheltered from the wind, uh, but it did start creeping through the uh, through the meadow and then burning parallel to Highway 175. And there are several houses and barns right along the, that frontage with 175, and they were immediately uh, threatened by by the fire. So anything else that was coming up 175 in response to the uh, Cobb fire ended up being waylaid to this one uh, to try and do what they could. Um, the Valley 2 eventually became a terrain driven fire probably uh, just after 5 o'clock in the afternoon and finally worked its way down to the drainage and then made a terrain run back up and across Highway 175 and got up onto the uh, face of Cobb Mountain. Eventually it got high up up enough that it became influenced by the wind. About 3.30 in the afternoon, I was parked at uh, Cobb Station 62. This was our initial command post till about uh, 5.30 that afternoon. And this is one of the pictures I took that showed my view. Um, I actually really expected the fire to come in the Cobb within an hour. Uh, it never did. The business district of Cobb was never affected. And they actually made a good stand at the at the grammar school that was just up the hill from there. Over the next couple hours, as the fire got further 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 up on Boggs Mountain, uh, was in full alignment with the uh, wind, and uh, it started a very active and very aggressive uh, burning, and eventually uh, burned through and around a couple uh, smaller subdivisions up on the side of uh, Boggs Mountain. Uh, this is a view from uh, Loch Lomond. It was taken, uh, actually there's several photographers working the area at that time, but uh, the area hadn't been evacuated yet, so they had a good vantage point from the back deck of somebody's home of uh, what the fire was doing from their viewpoint. And uh, the, vert the vertical uh, cloud formation in the live video that was taken it was definitely rotating in a uh, counterclockwise rotation. Uh, once they got evacuated from Loch Lomond, they drove around the north side of the fire. This is on Highway 29 near uh, Canocti Camp. And uh, you can see just how massive this thing grew in a short amount of time. Again, uh, this is uh, south of Lower Lake. And uh, this is probably about four miles south of Lower Lake by Murphy Springs Road. And I wanted to show this particular picture because the following morning when I was driving north on uh, Highway 29 to get to Canocti Camp for a briefing, uh, the fire was just south of Murphy Springs Road, uh, backing down towards the highway. Uh, this picture was provided by uh, the San Jose State, uh, their fire weather research lab had this in their report on, uh, on, on why they think what the fire did what it did, uh, showing the effects of the wind and uh, how it impacted the long range spotting. And by, by long range spotting, I mean it was at least a mile at some times because that's what the air attack was calling in. Um, 
later on I'll show you another picture that, that a woman took from Hidden Valley. Just before she uh, had taken that one picture, she was she had a leaf in her hand in the parking lot, and the fire was still several miles away from Hidden Valley. So the transport winds uh, carrying uh, debris from the fire was carrying it a very long ways. Uh, the weather in the couple days prior to the fire had been very hot and dry, um, near near 100 degrees, and humidity 8%, 10%, uh, 13%, right in that range. Or, uh, probably actually three days prior to the fire. Um, I was just wrapping up uh, work on the Elk Fire, which was north of uh, Clear Lake by the town of Upper Lake. And it started the previous Saturday. And it was the first fire we had in Lake County that actually behaved like a typical Lake County fire where it'll burn hard until the sun sets and then it will die down. And that one had actually done that. And all we had to do was uh, work about three days to get some line punched in around it. But uh, when that this little heat wave came in, we were very fortunate. We felt that the, the elk fire hadn't happened uh, in the midst of that heat wave. So this was a zone forecast uh, from early Friday morning uh, for the uh, Lake County area, and basically the winds were forecast uh, nothing over 10 miles an hour. And uh, this is the forecast I remember uh, as the fire was starting up because I was. Pretty sure it hadn't been forecast to have 20 plus mile an hour winds that day. Um, these are the maximum wind speeds uh, collected from uh, different RAWs stations in the area. Kanakdai, the Kanakdai RAWs, which is the line that has the uh, the numbers on it, that's the closest RAW station to the fire. It's just north of the fire area uh, by the uh, by the inmate camp. High Glade Lookout is on the Mendocino National Forest. Uh, north of Clear Lake. Uh, the Hopland Raws is in Mendocino County and Hawkeye is uh, in Sonoma County to the west and south of where the fire started. And I thought it was interesting to show it because it had peak winds at in the 40s um, later in the afternoon compared to uh, when Kanakai had theirs. The Fire Weather Research Lab uh, wrote a blog on what they thought uh, caused the uh, caused the wind speeds, and uh, basically it was the offshoot of the effects of Hurricane Linda uh, drifting north up the coast that created a, uh, a pressure gradient uh, just offshore. That uh, in Bodega Bay it was uh, at, at one o'clock the winds hit uh, 50 plus miles an hour. And uh, it was just a matter of uh, time for it to get into Lake County. Uh, another graph from a uh, Kanakdai Raw Station. The red line is the uh, direction of the maximum gust. So first thing in the morning, that there was a pretty strong push out of the north, and then it switched over to a predominant north northwest wind direction as the wind speed increased in the afternoon. And they eventually peaked at uh, 36 miles an hour. Just before 6 o'clock, I drove off the mountain. And uh, to get into Middletown, we were moving our command post to get out of the fire area. And uh, this is just after I got was on a conference call with the uh, incoming uh, incident management team. And I took the picture because what the flags were doing, uh, just before I walked inside, the flags were in a totally different direction. And so I just started taking pictures of the flag um, for the next hour or so because it was doing different things at different times. So this was just after 6 o'clock. And you can see off on the left through, uh, the glow of the fire through uh, through the tree line. Uh, this this um, is the radar map of what the smoke plume was doing uh, that the Weather Service uh, produced. Uh, an hour later, I took this picture, and the flags had quartered again. And you can see where the fire is uh, starting to come into Middletown at this time. And just so you know, that little greenhouse across the street, it survived uh, because we ended up with a, a hand crew and a dozer that were doing their best to punch some sort of control line just uh, north of the houses there.
Early on in the incident, uh, Greg Bertelli and I identified our appropriate action or leader's intent that we wanted uh, everybody to operate on. Uh, the first one, obviously, especially up on Cobb, was to effect uh, the evacuations of the civilians. Um, in some cases, that meant uh, taking shelter in a temporary refuge area, especially around the Pine Summit Pool. Uh, they were given giving people rides out of the area on the fire engine and taking them uh, to the Yogi Bear RV park just north of the fire area or other areas where they could get people out. Uh, and so they were very busy doing that. For our wireland urban interface tactics, we identified uh, prep and go tactics. Uh, we didn't want anybody anchoring in and, and trying to save any particular house, but didn't have enough fire engines to uh, even try doing that. And obviously uh, first responder safety was uh, very high on our uh, radar uh, and we made sure and I reminded everybody to uh, ensure that they had good escape routes and safety zones and not to compromise their own safety just to uh, try and save a house or anything like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, evacuations got started very early on this fire uh, within the first 20 minutes or so uh, Chief Bertelli uh, initiated the evacuation of the immediate fire area west of Ball of Rock Road and east of High Valley Road. Just before 2 o'clock, uh, in response to the increased fire behavior and the wind starting to uh, impact uh, the fire area, he extended this evacuation area to include the entire community of Cobb. As the fire got up into uh, Boggs Forest and was starting to make its initial run, we went ahead and did a mandatory evacuation for Harbin Hot Springs, which is down here. It's in the Box Canyon. Uh, it's a very popular um, clothing optional uh, hot springs and is usually fairly well uh, busy on, on Saturday. Then Big Canyon Road. Is a road that comes from Middletown. It works its way up here to Siegler uh, Springs. And there's various uh, older resort areas up in this area, plus some private ranches. It's not heavily populated, but um, it just needs to be done, especially for this upper end. And so we kept getting uh, reports of spotting and uh, the fire starting to move north towards Loch Lomond. I went ahead and uh, initiated the evacuation of the Loch Lomond area. Uh, this picture was taken by Miss Lopez uh, down at Hidden Valley Lake. It's actually a screenshot from a, a series of YouTube videos that she had. And you can see that uh, the Valley 2 fire is the smoke column on the left side. And the main valley fire is the, is the right-hand side as you're looking west up towards Cobb. And as the fire kept progressing and uh, long-range spotting kept being reported by the air attack plane, I went ahead and called for a mandatory evacuation of Middletown. And shortly thereafter, uh, included the entire Highway 175 corridor all the way down into the valley area. Initially, I asked for an advisory for the Hidden Valley Lakes, which is this area right here. It's a very large subdivision. And it has its own very unique uh, uh, fire history. But uh, and probably because at that time, I thought that the two fires had already merged together, and the main threat was the middle town. But the Hidden Valley Lakes is several miles north of Middletown. But based on some of the reports that were coming in and uh, spot fires that were be being reported uh, approaching Highway 29, I went ahead and made that mandatory evacuation uh, just before 8 o'clock. Uh, Ms. Lopez took this photograph. She had gone back up to her house, and I think she lives up on the Green Ridge somewhere, and it's a very high ridge uh, within the uh, subdivision. And you can see the smoke blowing across uh, just below the dam area at the lake. Uh, eventually, we started getting reports that the uh, houses were being threatened out on uh, Butts Canyon Road. 
And for reference, uh, this is Butts Canyon out through here. And then there's another subdivision right out here called Berryessa Estates. So I extended the evacuation to include this area initially, um, just because there's by then I was totally out of fire engines and any other thing I could throw at the fire. So the only thing I could do was get people out of the way at that time. Um, eventually, right about midnight, I got word that uh, the Pope Valley uh, Volunteer Fire District had an engine setting up for uh, structure protection uh, here in the Etna Springs area. And uh, about then, the uh, battalion chief from Butte County, Sean Norman, uh, showed up as part of the responding incident management team. And, and he uh, asked, well, how can I help you, Linda? I said, well, I'm glad you're here. Would you go scout out and see where the head of the fire is? And he came back an hour later and said it was basically here at the county line. And uh, it was just great. So um, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I, I met with the Napa County Sheriff. He drove up to the command post. And uh, based on the lack of solid intel, went ahead and just made this a big uh, evacuation area for the southeast side of the fire. As uh, things progressed, though, uh, we ended up with some uh, battling winds as the uh, northwest winds died off. Uh, we had battling winds all night long, and uh, we were starting to have problems up at the north end of the fire. So I just went ahead and did a mandatory evacuation for, for that last boxed area up there because I, I didn't know where the fire was at or where it was going, especially once the sun came up. So that was the extent of the evacuations that uh, that we enacted by Sunday morning. The sheriff uh, added another evacuation. There's a subdivision just off the north end of the map called Clear Lake Riviera. And it, just like the entire fire area, it's got very limited road uh, access and egress. So he went ahead and evacuated it, not knowing uh, what the winds would be doing into the next day or two. So uh, and several more people got evacuated. Um, this is the infrared map that was uh, produced that night. Uh, so we knew about um, right about midnight the fire was already roughly 40,000 acres. And you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a couple fingers looking into Napa County. So that's what the uh, Pope Valley people were seeing. Uh, another late afternoon picture from the Loch Lomond side. Um, he heavy timber throughout the Boggs Forest area and uh, uh, pretty much the total consumption of, of even the heavy fuels. Uh, structure damage. Uh, it's Part of the uh, team's uh, responsibilities, they did a damage assessment, and the total structure loss uh, in the fire area was uh, over 1,900 uh, structures. Most of those were, are in Lake County or were in Lake County. Uh, Single-family residences in uh, Lake County alone was well over uh, 1,200 uh, homes, along with uh, apartment complexes. Uh, most of the commercial damage was done. Um, uh, the Calpine Geysers field uh, lost uh, three or four cooling towers during the fire. Uh, different construction materials, uh, uh, anything and everything. Uh, Cobb is a very, uh, is an older uh, community and it had a mix of old cabins and some newer homes. So um, the fact that most of it at the very bottom were identified as unknown uh, building construction materials uh, is because most of the most of the buildings were totally consumed in the fire, and all that was left were foundations. Uh, some of the local fuel projects uh, that I'll talk about: the Trinity Road area. Uh, there's a shaded fuel break that is within the circle area, and uh, that that had been getting worked on uh, with the South Lake uh, Fire Safe Council, along with Kanaktai Conservation Camp inmate crews. They had been working on that uh, for two or three years, and they created a shaded fuel break just below the subdivision. And although pretty much all the homes were lost in that subdivision except for one, um, I think it gave them enough time, especially the two fire engines that were still in the area and some of the local citizens, uh, it gave them just enough time, I think, to get into the uh, Pine Summit area where they could uh, 
use that as a temporary refuge area because along with that pool there's also a, a large green pasture where some horses were and that gave them a little bit of a buffer so I think that one helped uh, the community uh, this one here this this compound right here is the Boggs Hell Attack Base and they've been clearing this along the landing strip uh, quite some time and this down here is actually at least 100 feet down the hill from the main uh, landing zone for the helicopter um, this neighborhood here was totally destroyed by the fire and uh, the heat of all the structures burning along with winds just drove the fire uh, right along and below the hell attack base and uh, they lost a couple storage containers here on the back side of the compound uh, one of the pilots had his RV uh, parked there and he lost that too but the the main barracks and the storage garage uh, survived uh, the forester's office is up over in here and it it survived too there's still enough people even after they airlifted all the injured firefighters they had just enough people to uh, uh, defend what they had in there they didn't have a fire engine so they were doing with garden hoses and and uh, doing what they could with that uh, the Hidden Valley area uh, Tim Walsh is the uh, uh, crew superintendent for the Marin County Fire Department uh, TAM crew is a type 1 crew and they were up on the fire and he wrote a, a very nice article and it's posted on the Wildfire Lessons Learned website uh, on hand crew utilization in the wildland urban interface and in his article he talks about uh, some of the fuel modifications that have taken place within the subdivision they have a very good um, very rigorous uh, weed abatement program within the subdivision and uh, they don't let people uh, slack off on it uh, and he talks about uh, that reduced fuel load especially there along the uh, the black line that gave them the opportunity to get in there and do some good work along with the fire engines working in the area um, he talks about uh, using garden hoses off the peoples that were in the backyards and how that helped them out so uh, there were probably seven fire engines and uh, along with the hand crew and uh, there was some structure loss and mainly because how the fire was spotting they got stretched pretty thin but they did a, a remarkable job regardless of uh, <laughs> regardless of uh, what they were dealing with uh, th these are some of the projects uh, that South Lake uh, Fire Safe Council has either done or are in the works uh, with, with various uh, grants and whatnot. Um, several of them are in maintenance uh, phase, and some of them still need work. But uh, so some of the things that worked. At, what helped uh, early on was getting a law enforcement representative to the command post. Uh, Fire Chief 700, who is Willie Cepeda, he, at that time he was still working with uh, the County Office of Emergency Services. He was trying to get to my location, driving in along 175 from the Lower Lake side, but he couldn't, uh, couldn't get to where I was at because the fire had already blown over 175. So he ended up uh, rolling over into an operational role as a division supervisor for the north side of the fire. If he had managed to get to where I was at, I may not have needed a law enforcement rep because uh, uh, Willie has all the contacts. But uh, once he got committed, and you know, it's obvious I, I was going to need to continue uh, some widespread evacuations, I made a request for a representative from the sheriff's office and I had a sergeant with me probably within the next 20 minutes. and. Uh, we stayed partnered up the rest of the night. Uh, PG&E showed up at about uh, one of the local uh, service techs uh, showed up at the command post while I was still up on Cobb about 1600 hours 4 p.m. and uh, asked what uh, he could do for me and I told him to uh, kill the power in the entire mountainside. Uh, we had a snowstorm up on Cobb back in 2010 that caused widespread damage to the power system up there and I had done the same thing on that so I knew they could do it uh, not too far away from where the command post was uh, one of the challenges for PG&E is uh, 
anytime we needed to have them uh, kill the power in any given area, they had to do that with a manual pull. There's, it's not automated like in other parts of the state. So um, early in the morning when the fire made a good run uh, through Loch Lomond, uh, we had to get them a, a pretty tight address range so they knew exactly where to uh, pull the power. But pg e was with us the entire night, including their emergency rep uh, that came up from Sacramento once she could work her way through all the roadblocks. But uh, it was great having them there. Uh, another thing that worked well was early activation of the incident management teams. There's a uh, Type 3 team in the North Bay area, primarily staffed by Marin County uh, fire personnel. Uh, getting them involved early on was a huge success. They uh, took a lot of load off of us for uh, doing the planning uh, for the next uh, operational period. Uh, one of the chiefs actually came up to the command post while we were in Middletown and, and met face-to-face -face with uh, with operations and uh, just to uh, improve uh, how we identified different divisions on the fire and branch it. Uh, we branched it that night and uh, just got help get us all on the same page early on. And then obviously having the Type 1 team coming in uh, several of them started filtering in that night and uh, were actively engaged in by uh, first thing in the morning in uh, doing operational issues. And uh, obviously a local knowledge played a huge factor. Um, I was glad I'd worked a, a dozen years up in the Cobb area, so uh, I knew the landmarks, I knew who the local government players were, um, and that certainly helped me. I don't think I would have been near as effective if I'd been working the fire in Sonoma County, where I don't know the terrain features as well. But uh, so those are the four things I think that worked well for uh, for us that first night. Uh, lessons learned uh, primarily deal with um, the evacuation process um, because it's what I noticed and. Uh, in preparing for this webinar, I checked out some other previous webinars that were posted and came across one that talks about evacuation as being a social process. And that really uh, clarified some issues for me because when I'd taken a swing through that one neighborhood uh, making announcements for evacuations, there were some people, and there was people standing in the street talking to the other people. And, and uh, it's like, hey, you know, you need to evacuate. Yeah, yeah, we know, we know. And uh, they went back to talking amongst themselves. So understanding the social impact of, of uh, the evacuation process helps quite a bit. Because um, if they can't see the threat, they're going to validate it on their own. And that just adds time or to the reflex time for them to actually hit the road and start uh, evacuating. And then uh, from listening to all the 911 tapes, uh, well, not all of them, but I listened to them up to about 10 o'clock that night. Um, the, the repeated questions on well, which way do I go, which way do I go, um, really struck home and I think that's probably something that uh, maybe we need to do a better job on is uh, helping people understand that sometimes in uh, the case of an evacuation process for a large-scale disaster like this uh, that they're on their own sometimes and they need to take that self-initiative. Um, so. Uh, because there, there are multiple times uh, that, that our uh, captains and comm operators in our command center were trying to guide people out. And, and I get it if somebody, and there were some people, they just moved into Hidden Valley within the previous month, and I understand that. They probably don't know the road system, but um, it's definitely um, something that maybe we can help with uh, going into the future. And. Uh, Here's a list of references uh, on there, especially uh, the one from the Fire Weather Research Laboratory. Uh, did tropical moisture contribute to the Valley Fire rapid rate of spread? So that's a very good read. And uh, that's the end of my pres presentation. Wow. Uh, that was such a great walkthrough. Um, I've, I mean, I'm not from that area, but I know how it affected so many people, and that was super informative and thank you for the lessons learned at the end there too. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have already queued up. I want to invite everybody if uh, you have questions type them to the chat box there and we'll go through them here. Um, so the first one is any perspective on the resident stay and defend or shelter in place policies as a result of this fire? 
Um, my, my perspective on stay and defend, um, I actually helped write the part of the uh, um, section for our for Lake County's Community Wildfire Protection Plan uh, while I was still battalion chief. And at that time, uh, stay and defend and shelter in place was sitting on the uh, balance point between that being okay language or not, uh, but then the uh, fires happened in Australia that killed a couple hundred people. And uh, Cal Fire's perspective is uh, we, we can't go with but stay and defend because of the potential uh, risk to the civilian population. We just can't buy into that. And, uh, and that's reflected in the local CWPP. Uh, basically, if it's time to evacuate, you need to evacuate. And uh, you know, I, I think that's the best course of action to take. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, were there any communities in the area that were firewise recognized communities? And were there any evacuation route maps done prior for the, any of the communities and in the hand of residents for pre-planning of this kind of event? Oh, I'd probably refer that one to uh, Mike Wink. I know he's out there somewhere if he types in, but uh, he's a local battalion chief. I'm I'm not aware that any of the fire safe councils in Lake County have uh, achieved the firewise uh, recognition. And uh, as far as the evacuation routes, I know like in Anderson Springs, they had, there's a community park in the middle of the Anderson Springs area pre-identified as a temporary refuge area. And I believe the uh, Pine Summit Pool is as well. Um, the evacuation route maps are, are not done for the county. and uh, would probably help, I'm sure. Looks like uh, he's typing. So this is Mike Link. Uh, he said the Hidden Valley Lake Association members had maps sent to all of them in the mail. Okay, um, so that's better information. So, um, but that may not have helped people who were just in, in the area for a, a month if uh, those got mailed out in the springtime. So, so I want to say. Uh, you know, if anybody has questions, feel free to keep typing them. But I'm going to take a moment here. Uh, you gave a great lead in to our next webinar, which is on May 19th. And it's the challenges of single access subdivisions in the wildland urban interface areas with David Kahn. So again, that's May 19th at 11 AM, a little less than a month away. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a list of web links, and the first one is to the WUI webinar series, and that the information for that, uh, registering for that, and then it'll be the same process. Register, I'll send the link out, and then the link to the presentation will also be online the day of the webinar. So join us for that if you're interested in learning more about some of the things you, uh, you mentioned today, Linda, about getting out in time, um, especially in these single access subdivisions. And we have a couple other ones coming up in June. We're going to try to get someone to talk in a similar fashion about the 2016 Butte Fire case study lesson learned. And then in July, we're going to talk um, about land use planning to reduce wildland fire risk, lessons from five western cities. And that's from Dr. Kimoko Barrett from the Headwaters Economics. And so all of those, uh, as we get all the information about them, again, it'll be on that WUI webinar series page, that first link. And then from uh, your presentation today, Linda, we have did tropical moisture contribute to the Valley Fire rapid rate of spread, which is the last uh, link article in that reference there. So if you're having trouble clicking on it through there, you can click on it here to get more information about that. I also want to mention that we do have a WUI webinar evaluation. It's like five questions, five to ten questions, super fast, and it really helps us uh, both report back to our funders and to know um, if there's other things we want to talk about or how we're doing. I do want to mention that someone typed in a comment about a month ago, and that's going to be another webinar that's with land fire. So different topic, but just to show that we really do use those webinar evaluations. And the last two things, um, I'm going to I'm going to point out the last one: email sign up for the CFSC newsletter. So once a month, uh, I send out a newsletter with announcements about webinars, field events, and other, any new products. Um, so it's pretty easy to sign up for that, and I promise not to spam you too much. And that's whew, that's all the spiel I have. Uh, we looks like we have another couple comments and questions, so let's get back into that. 
Uh, the next question is, how did the reverse 911 system work for such a large area, and were folks able to get any notifications? Uh, Lake County does use a uh, reverse 911 program. It's administered uh, by the uh, county service office. Um, they did. It was being used. Uh, I think it got compromised early in, in the Cobb area as the uh, power poles got burned up and uh, it took out some of the phone lines. So not everybody got that early notification. I know they used the reverse 911. Uh, all the way out to uh, Hidden Valley uh, because Miss Lopez in one of her videos uh, you can hear somebody mention hey uh, we're under an advisory so I know the notification was going out and I definitely used it for uh, that last area in the uh, northern part uh, so uh, it worked and I think it worked well um, but not everybody that lives in Lake County has a has a phone and uh, you can register for Nixle alerts, and, and that's another means that people were getting notification. But uh, again, if, if people don't register their phone numbers, they're not going to get um, get those uh, notifications. Okay, we have another one. Uh, the TRAs were obviously effective for the engine crews. So, what happened to the local Helitac crew members that got burned over? Uh, the Hell Attack crew had uh, uh, started their work from near the uh, heel or the origin area of the fire, and they were uh, doing more point protection. And they had actually uh, skipped ahead to uh, check on a uh, on a building to see if they could do something uh, to protect it. And uh, the fire behavior increased dramatically at that particular moment in time, and they didn't have time to pull back. So. Uh, that's what happened to them. We're glad that everyone turned out to be okay in that for sure. Um, the next one is, were any compressed air foam units used in the extinguishment? Uh, not during the initial attack. Uh, all we had out there were type 2 and type 3 engines uh, uh, for the first day. Uh, if uh, compressed air systems came in on some of the engines ordered on later on in the incident by the by the management team. I don't have knowledge of that. Okay, last chance if anybody else wants to type a question, but um, great variety of questions, so thanks everybody for participating with that. And also, as we mentioned earlier in the chat box, this presentation is recorded and we will post it online. So again, that WUI webinar series will have a link to the recording in the PDF. Um, of this presentation, so you can watch it and share it at your leisure. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. That was a wonderful presentation, and I'm sure we'll get a lot of future use from it. I think a lot of people were really interested in hearing about this, and you did an excellent job. So thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. All right, it looks like we're going to end a few minutes here early. So everyone have a wonderful day, and thank you for joining us.